get started the next uh, get started i see there are 12 questions that game whoa <laughs> a lot of questions and so i'm sure you'll be able to take care of my phone <laughs> we'll start from the beginning we'll start from the very beginning um okay great so um welcome everyone uh thank you so much for joining us um, it's one of our first events, live events, where people can really get involved with the Jewish Physicians Network. So I just want to thank everyone for making an effort to attend. Um, special thanks to uh, Menachem Jacobs for, for getting us here. We've put a lot of, he's put a lot of effort into discussing the background material so that we can enter this conversation um, just a little bit more knowledgeable. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Yonatan, for setting this up. I know that I missed exams. It was difficult, so I really appreciate you um, arranging for everything. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, thank you, Rabbi Willig. Um, just as an introduction, Rabbi Willig is the Rosh Kolo in Yeshivas Rabbeinu Yitzhak Achanan. Um, usually, most people will know it as Ritz. Uh, he's the Rav to many doctors individually and an expert in medical halacha. And uh, thank you for coming on and sharing your time and willing to address our questions. We really appreciate it. That's a big pleasure to help people <laughs> who help other people. <laughs> um, great. So before we dive right into the questions, is there any disclaimers you want to share? Um, I think what we are looking to do is really just clear the air. I think with a lot of times when we enter these conversations, people go based on what they see and what they hear. They see um, from residents doing certain things or they hear from their friend that they got a head there for certain things. And we just want to clear the air and, and really hear directly from you exactly what you have to say on the topic. Fine. My understanding after your first two introductory questions, which uh, we don't have to even get into with this, they're not so relevant. Question number three is the main question of the night. That is the main question of the night. Um, I think uh, people would appreciate hearing a little bit of the background of one and two, if that's okay. I can talk about it a little bit, but those, you know, um, uh, this, this distinction between a POSIC and a ROV is somewhat artificial, because technically speaking, every ROV is given a, a yori yori, is given the ability to pass him. So by definition, every ROV is supposed to be considered to be in the category of a POSIC. The reality is, as we well know, as you know, from your field of medicine, everyone has the same MD degree, but not every MD is created equal. I mean, they're created equal, but they're not art. They aren't, they aren't equal. And uh, there are specialists and there are, you know, higher level physicians in, every, in any given field. And you always try to, you know, get to a, a higher level doctor to get a more definitive answer to your medical question. And the same thing is true of, of the rabbinical field. The equation between doctors and rabbis was brought out in a very interesting piece that was sent to me on Friday by Gil Student on his daily raid. It was entitled Rabbi Dr. Google, <laughs> of any sort. Rabbi Dr. Google. And he said exactly what I've been saying for, for years and years and years. You know, people, they pass can shyless based on, on the internet. I said, would you, would you answer a medical question based on the internet? The sad answer is yes to both. <laughs> they, 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 crazy. You can kill yourself if you follow the internet and medical matters. Just to give an example, you would never get vaccinated for COVID. I mean, the internet is nefarious. You don't have to. Black on white. So why should you uh, come on? You know. So the same thing is true of halacha. Anything you want to find in the halacha world, you find on the internet. And it's irrelevant. You need someone who's, uh, who knows the field someone who's reliable, someone who, who understands both the, the halacha and the, and the reality. Same as in medicine. You're trained so many years to, to become proficient. And then some, some nut wants to decide that. <laughs> ridiculous. So I don't even, I don't enter into these discussions. I got a, got a, a WhatsApp from an anti-vaxxer last week trying to convince me that I should change my mind about whether schools have to make sure they're vaccines for children. That I, I didn't even... I know it's a little impolite. I didn't even return the the, the, the WhatsApp. It's pointless, futile. Yeah. People try to trap you. And I'm involved in a couple of these shivas. Before we get to COVID, the, the, the measles anti-vaxxers. So, you know, I, I ruled for two different schools, one in Jersey, one in Long Island. The kids cannot come into the school, period. You're not, you know, vaccine for measles, don't let them in. Some lady called me up. I don't know what she wanted. Comes to my office in the yeshiva, this is pre-COVID. 
as after a few minutes she starts haranguing me about how how dare we be so cruel. Kids are not in school. I said thank you very much, and then showed her the door, which is not my style. He can't talk to these people. Nothing. But she has the uh, internet and then, uh, you know, so a, a Rav and a Paisik should be synonymous, but there are people who are Rabbanim who are ignorant. Sadly, the people who attempt to pass the Shaz are also ignorant. There are also doctors who are ignorant. You know, this, this, is, this is, should not be a surprise. There are quacks in the medical field who say you shouldn't get vaccinated, not for measles, not for COVID, not for anything. Quacks, quacks. Like a duck, they quack, quack, quack. People ask me all the time. I just send them to my Talmud and someone you know, Rabbi Dr. Aaron Glatt. So if you can convince him, then I will follow it. So you can convince him you're wasting your time by talking to me. That's it. That's why I get rid of them very quickly. But the same thing is true in the, in the rabbinate. There, there are people who know, people who don't know. Got to try to find someone who's, who knows the, knows the facts, who knows the halacha. That's what's called a rub and a paisik. If he doesn't know, he should not pass in Shilas, but there are many people who go with the name Rav, or maybe Rabbi, who are functionaries. In some shuls, the Rabbi is basically a uh, social worker. Yeah, a social worker. He makes sure that the, uh, that the social activities go on, and makes sure he takes care of Bikr Cholim and Nicham Avelim and life cycle events, and he may be a very talented orator, but the Psak has nothing to do. And I want to tell you, for decades and decades, this was the this, this was the primary American rabbinate. When I grew up, that's how it was, because Shilas did not come too often, and uh, many rabbanim, they were, I will forgive the expression, amaratim, didn't know anything in halacha, but it didn't matter because no one asked; they didn't have to answer. That's all. So they were, he just was a an, an outstanding orator and a social worker and a pastor, all good things. And he did a good job. And for that period of time, he was equipped. You know, they say, Parnas of Fiador. The leader is a, depends on the generation. But of course, since that time, in the last, uh, let's call it uh, 50 years, let's talk about call that, it's changed. And thank God there are many more people who are concerned about halacha and they want a good answer from, the, from their Rav. And they can tell the Rav doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay. So then uh, they, they decided to get a, look for a different roof. There are many people who have a community rabbi in their shul to whom they go for their life cycle events. When it comes to a shah, they ask somebody else because they know the rabbi is not equipped. Okay? So that will be a dichotomy between the person and the roof. And you should have different roles. Does it right. matter the roof more than most? Absolutely. Absolutely. Most people don't get a roof so much a person's an accountant. The accountant, he's, he's, he's making sure to, to be honest. And he, what does he need a rough for? Even a lawyer, a little more shyless, but honest. Doesn't need to, doctors? The shyless every single day. Doctors need a rough more than anybody else. And therefore, I think that uh, it's uh, important that every single doctor have a rough, that he can, mm-hmm. not just a rough, a pusik, let's call it spade a spade, someone who's number one accessible. You know, my post was Rav Yashiv. Great, but you can't get to him. So, 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 so the the God of the door is very true, but you can't get to him. You have a child which needs an answer right away. He, he can't. You know, so now he's no longer with us, but there are other equivalent great rabbis throughout the world, both in America and in Eretz Yisrael. But if you can't get to them, or it takes too long to get to them, by the time you get to them, the child is already moot. You're not in such good shape. You really have to... Uh, Try to get someone who's more accessible. These days, you know, access is a little bit easier because there's things called cell phones and WhatsApps and texts and emails. And different rabbis use different media to uh, both to be contacted and to contact somebody else. You can probably get a quicker answer now than you could have gotten 20 years ago. And all these things didn't exist. And that's good for a doctor who often has to give an instant answer. It's not always comfortable to give an instant answer. I remember a story. It was once at a yeshiva dinner in Chicago. I was speaking there. And in the middle of the dinner, I got a, something. I, I had a, a cell phone. And I, I walk out of the, you know, the, the hall where they're having a, a suda mitzvah. 
I go into the back and someone's calling me with an end of life Shiloh. A serious end of life. Those are the most serious ones. End of life Shiloh. And I try to answer the best I could. You know, a few minutes, they, needed, they, they didn't answer right away. I said, you know, a Shiloh like this, 200 years ago, Rabbi Kiva Ege would sit for a week trying to figure this one out. And I have to answer in five minutes. You know, but, but that's the world we live in. You can't say come back in a week. It's too late. So uh, Rabbanim are somewhat limited. Then Rabbanim who have more experience, who have heard the Shiloh before, have a better chance of getting it right. But you can always get it wrong. I, I must tell you that I, I've gotten many things wrong. And I think that most of the time that I got it wrong, that was not properly apprised of the realia. We call in our language the Metzius. I got the Metzius wrong. Could be as recently as Thursday. I asked a question, which is probably the wrong question, and I gave an answer, which is probably the wrong answer, because I didn't have the proper understanding, I think, of the reality. I'm not sure you still have to find, maybe I'll find out tomorrow, whether I was right or wrong. But, but that's the key. You have to know what exactly the, the facts are, and then try to apply the, the relevant uh, halacha. That's my introduction. Well, all right. Thank you. <laughs> and I think uh, we'll try to, to get to the meat and potatoes. I know a lot of people here are waiting for, for the hardcore questions. So, Benachem, why don't you start us off? So, I, I guess, um, and I know the second question might sound a little more academic, but I felt that for the, um, just that we, we, the, the Chabura here has kind of gone through this topic uh, at some length. We went through uh, a quick synopsis of the different opinions that relate to the subject from Rav Shechter, from Rav Moshe, or from Zaman Arbach, as is found in Yens Chivas, as well as in Shemir Shabbat Kilchasa. And I was wondering, when you look at the sugya of Shabbos and residency, uh, do you have a particular model that you look at? Is this a case of Hayitza uh, B'Shayara, as we see in Sim Reish Mem Ches of, of, of Shulchan Aruch, or is this you know, something more akin to Pukuch Nefesh, especially working in a hospital network that has more Jews, uh, as Rav Shem Zalman kind of models this question? Okay. If you give some background on how you look at it. I, I, I've always assumed that any physician who enters any medical field will be called upon at one point in time to do Chilul Shabbos for someone who's an Eino Yehudi. I think it's almost inevitable. I cannot, it's hard for me to imagine in America, in Eretz I don't know, in America, could be even in Eretz Israel, but in America for sure, I should probably go through an entire medical career and never be called upon to do Chilul Shabbos for an Eino Yehudi. To my mind, that's statistically near impossible. Never say never, but near impossible. So your first, first up question is, how do you relate, how do you relate to that? How do you relate to that? What, what do you say about that? And there are different opinions, as you probably are aware. Uh, the Mishnah Brewer, if read at face value, says no. N-O spells no, because the Mishnah says no, and the Gemara says no. And he calls the doctors, Mechal le Shabbos Mephahesia, Hashem Yerachim. The Satan Rebbe pointed out that somebody tried to say that he was only referring to uh, India, where they're idol worshippers. And the Satan Rebbe exposes it as a fraud, a fraudulent emendation. Yeah, my Mr. Brewer. This is uh, something which the Satan Rebbe wrote about. How dare they add that into the Mr. Brewer, which he never said. And he proves it from the various prints of the Mr. Brewer that the print didn't say that. Then they tried to cover up that they were tinkering with it, and he was very, very upset, was the Rebbe. The Rebbe was, of course, correct. It was a tinkering with the text of the Mishnah Brewer. He never said that. He never presumably would. He never would say that, really. And uh, that's something which is unfortunate. But, you know, that's, that's the reality of things. Now, the, uh, what the Mishnah Brewer says, that anyone who helps a Mechal uh, Shabbos for an Eino Yehudi He's someone who was a Mechal Shabbos of Hesya, Hashem Yishmerenu, which is exactly what the Mishnah Ruhr does say. Comes from Moshe and says, he doesn't understand. Didn't the Mishnah Ruhr live in the real world? Didn't he know that if a Yid in those countries, Poland, Russia, would, a Yiddish doctor would refuse to report to save a non Jewish patient, they'd kill him and all the Jews in the pogrom in one shot. They didn't need too much of an excuse to kill Jews in, in Europe. Unfortunately, they killed Jews for no reason whatsoever. None. No reason. So certainly they would, they would use it as an excuse to kill Jews. How could the, Chavetz, the Holy Chavetz Chaim have written that? This is a question which Ramosh raises in his famous Shuvah. And therefore he says, and 
is preceded by great people for already many generations. Already the Chassam Sofa said it, the Divrei Chaim said it, people from different parts of the world said it, that you have to be Mechal al Shabbos. You know why? If you're not Mechal al Shabbos, you're putting Jewish lives in danger. Jewish lives are in danger. I, I have to imagine all of you know about this. I'm not telling you anything which you don't know, but it's important to review just when you're, when you're beginning to start from the beginning. That's what it says. Uh, Rav Shechta famously has said and he has written that that being the case, when an individual who was a physician is called upon to, to do Chilul Shabbos to save the life of an any Yehudi, which he must do, he accepts the psak of Rav Moshe and the Chasam Seifer and the Divrei Chaim and the Minchat Shlomo Shlomo Zalman and many others. So this is much longer than that. Has to be done. Rav Shechta Shlita added that if that's the case, you have to have that in your head that when you are doing Chilul Shabbos, you're doing Chilul Shabbos to save Jewish life. As the Mishnah and the Gemara record now, you're saving Mr. Jones. But by saving Mr. Jones, you may be saving, as they say in, in the old ads, the life you save may be your own. It's a try to stop smoking, if I recall, from my youth. Because uh, it may be your own. But it may be the, the life of other Jewish people, other Jewish physicians, other Jewish people, who could be Khalil of Achaz endangered if you would refuse to uh, get involved in that Pikuach Nefesh situation for the Eina Yehudi. And he wants you to have that in mind whenever, you, whenever you're doing anything on Shabbos. My personal view on this is that although Rav Shech the Shlita is certainly correct in principle, it's not necessary to have this in mind the whole time. The person can't, who can take this the whole time? I'm busy saving this patient. I don't look at his, at his religion. I don't look at anything. I have to save the patient. I look at his heart or his lungs. It's all I'm looking at, nothing else. My view is, as a principle, of kola osa das yeshona huosa, that whenever you are involved in a long term situation, if at the very beginning you enunciate that you have a certain intention, that can carry through almost indefinitely. Kola osa das yeshona huosa. Of Shech the Shlita, which is printed in his sefer, I believe, Big Fat Zone, uh, questions that. He doesn't know how long that, that would really work. And uh, if he's right, then doctors are in trouble. Uh, I hope that I'm right, that uh, it's enough to have the Barisha. How do you define Barishona? So that's a question. In my view, at, at the most, it's required once every Shabbos, at most. Could be enough once every career. The first Shabbos that you're on, you say, listen, uh, every time I have to do Chilu Shabbos and Yehudi, I really have in mind for the saving the uh, uh, Nefesh Yehudi. And that's what I have planned for the rest of my medical career. You don't like that? Once a Shabbos, when you, when, you, when, you, <laughs> when you arrive in a situation where you have to kill a Shabbos, you have that in mind that carries you through the entire Shabbos. I don't think it's possible for a doctor to focus on this kind of a kavana throughout the long day when taking care of many patients in a Yehudim. That's my general approach. There are those who are much more strict. The Chavetz Chaim is read, read literally. And there are those who are much more lenient for one of two reasons. There are those who maintain, this is, I haven't just mentioned about it in my shul yesterday. I remember when Rabbi Untamin, the Chron of the Racha, was the chief rabbi of, 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 of Israel in the late 60s, came to our yeshiva in the aftermath of a core celeb, which is all a fake, it turned out. Uh, they made up a story that a black fellow was on a motorcycle and he ran into the chain across Meir Shoram that closes the street, and he went flying in the air, and he came splattering down, and no one took care of him, because he was an Ainu Yehudi, and all the newspapers went crazy, how can the Jews be so cruel, and the chief rabbinate so bad, da-da, da-da, da-da. Never happened, the story, it was a provocation. Just, it never really happened, that's what I was told. But look. So Rabbi Untiman was under the gun, chief rabbi, came to YU, and gave a long speech about this topic. And he said, you know what? Because the Torah's ways are pleasant and it's past all peace. So you have to do Chil Shabbos. My Rebbe Rav Salavetchik, the Chronicle of the next day to the Shia, was not at all happy with that. He was very unhappy. He said, you can't make up those kind of dinner. 
It's true, as Rav Utim and quoted from the Gemara Masech, the Yavamis, that Chazal will take that phrase very seriously. Not just a song you sing when you put away the Sefer Torah. It's very serious. And there was even a, a source in the Gemara Yavamis to exempt a particular woman from Chalitza. Chazal interpreted the Dimena Torah based upon Drocher Darach Noah. That's true, where well, they did it. We have no right to do it on our own. He was very upset with Rav Unterman's uh, statement. Fine. More recently, there was another attempt to uh, understand this, uh, based upon a reading of the Ramban in the, the Sefer Mitzvahs, which seemed to indicate, at least to some, that the Ramban held that although the mission is explicit, that to save an Eino Yehudi may not be done with Malacha on Shabbos, what if the person is what we call a Ger Toshav? A Ger Toshav is someone who accepts upon himself the seven mitzvahs of Bnei Noach, no more than that. So the way that this, these people read the Ramban is to say that it's also permissible. I did not read the Ramban that way at all. It's a question how you read that Ramban. Um, not that long ago, uh, the Society of Talmudim and Einstein Medical School put out something called Rapo Yerape. I believe the editor of this issue was someone named uh, Dr. Karp, a Talmud of mine. And he quoted, there was a piece there by a fellow named Dove Carroll, who was quoted in this piece. Dove Carroll is a very loyal Talmud of Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein, Zechat Sadek Rocha. And he attested that Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein read the Ramban that way. Before that, I had heard that Rabbi Riskin read the Ramban that way. That I didn't give too much mind to because I didn't know if he was going to be able to read the Ramban properly. And I heard Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein read it that way. And Dr. Karp claims that the Tashbates read it that way. I wasn't sure that's true either. The kids, I don't know if anyone properly reads it that way, but there's some who make that claim. And then they extend it by saying that today, a typical Enihudi is a Ger Tosho because he keeps the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach. That's questionable on two grounds. Does he keep the Sheva Mitzvahs? Really? It talks about Gezel, it talks about Arias, it talks about <laughs> things that not everyone keeps. And number two, it's not at all clear that someone who keeps all seven without a formal Kabbalah and a Bezdin has a status of a Ger Tosha. That comes up now with the, the Shemitah question of selling the land to a Ger Tosha. There is no Ger Tosha, no Eved Ivri, no egg. It's complicated on many levels. So those are the ways that there are people who have a more intrinsic uh, dispensation to take care of an Eni Yehudi. But now I'm a, no, I'm a traditionalist. I think it's permissible based on Ramosh and Chasam Sof and the Rechaim. On that basis. Now, having said that, does a person have a right to enter into such a situation in the first place? Mm-hmm. It's like Simon Reish Memches. Exactly. You're putting yourself into a situation where down the road you're going to have to be Shabbos and save a Jewish life, your own, somebody else's. May you or may you not. The bottom line, as I read it, is if there's no alternative, you may do so, but Mako Mitzvah. Look at Simon Rish, Rish Memchaz carefully. There's a Balamor, there's a Rivosh, there's a Mechaber. It's, it's a, I'm not going into every detail. You've probably seen it already. And I always said that's what's the head there all the years that doctors were from before they had Shomer Shabbos residencies. They didn't exist. How did you become a doctor? There should have been no from doctors and, until, I don't know, 40 years ago, a little more, 50 years ago when they started the Shomer Shabbos residency. You can do the history yourself, Google it. I don't know when the thing when it started officially. I do not believe it was more than 50 years ago, unless I'm making a mistake historically. It started around 40 something years ago, I believe. And 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 the, so they all all Machal Shabbos with Hesi Hashem Shvereinu. So no, the Reish Mem Ches model was their model. There was no way to become a doctor without doing so. I presume they were pro- properly directed to only do things which had to be done. And of course, whatever can be done to an Eina Yehudi, whatever can be done Bishinui, sure they were given proper instructions. And uh, even though, according to the Gemara, the Mishnah, you're not supposed to do Chilul Shabbos for an Eina Yehudi. In today's world, you have no no alternative. Only your choice is don't become a doctor at all. Want to become a doctor? That's the way to do it. No alternative. Now they started something called Shoma Shabbos residency. Oh, so I'm a player over here. I need a cotton. Not from today, but from, let's see how many years ago it was. Let's see. Almost 40 years ago. Not quite 40 years ago. I had two Tamidim 
both learned by me in the yeshiva, and they both got into Columbia Medical School, very prestigious medical school in, in, in New York and Washington Heights. And they graduated, and they had acceptances to Harvard, Yale, Columbia. These are top students. Only problem was, it required Chilul Shabbos. Right? Maybe they had the Chilul Shabbos. But they were also offered a position in downstate, nowhere near Harvard, Yale, and, and Columbia, and their reputation. But downstate offered them complete Shmira Shabbos. Rebbe, what should we do? I told them to go to downstate. Oh, man. Can I use the expression? All hell broke loose in <laughs> Columbia. Because apparently when the, when the doctors match, they have to publicize where they matched. It doesn't say where they got in, where they could have gone. It doesn't say this guy, I believe one of those doctors was Dr. Glad himself, my, my infectious disease expert. He matched, he was a brilliant student matched in Columbia and Harvard and Yale. And he went to downstate because of me. Your vault. I think after one more year, they refused to give interviews to any yeshiva college student. I think that 40 years went by, and there's no yeshiva college grad in Columbia University Medical School. You can check my facts. The fellow died some years ago. Now they had a few came in. The first one was Yona Rubin from my own shul, the first one to get back into Columbia, and they've gotten a few more in since then. They didn't want to get involved because they knew no matter what they say, they're not going to want to do it because they show much Travis Jew. The kids are, that's what I feel. Now, Years later, in our, and I came to Robin Shul in, 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 in Riverdale, we had a discussion of this, and two doctors, the president of my shul and the vice president of my shul, had a machloik that's right in front of the whole shul, and I was giving a shir. Is it better to train in Harvard or Maimonides? The president trained in Maimonides, a brilliant, 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 brilliant physician, radiologist, who, you know, radiologist and oncologist who Brilliant diagnostician, brilliant practitioner, terrific, fantastic. No one denies that. He's super. The other fellow, the vice president, also brilliant diagnostician, brilliant, brilliant. He trained in Harvard. So he had a dash and dash and fazich. The one who went to Harvard said, yeah, Harvard's much better training. Then I said, no. You know, my money is, you can also get good training. It, it all depends on what kind of Balkishan you are, you know, how, how how smart you are. If you're really smart, you'll be a good doctor, but the Maimonides background. I'm not here to decide who's right. Probably the, the, the truth lies somewhere in between. It depends upon your field, depends upon the, who you are, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, I've consistently told the residents who asked me that if there's an alternative, which is Shalom Shabbos, they should take that alternative. And to use the expression, even if it involves marrying beneath your station, which means, as, as Aaron Glatt did, he could have gone to Columbia Harvard. Yeah, went to Downstate. He married beneath the station for Shmira Shabbos. Some can do much better by going out of town. I have a doctor in my own shul, a very brilliant doctor, and he went to St. Louis for a few years. Who wants to go to St. Louis? His whole family was, uh, no one was from there. I mean, a little town was already going back. Now it got, now it got to get more of a Malcolm Torah, but we're talking now, uh, Again, 40 years ago, St. Louis was not, not that much Yiddish guy there, but he had a totally Shomer Shabbos job in a pretty good hospital. May not have been as, as good as what he could have done here, but it was, you know, better than Maimonides or uh, better than downstate, reputation-wise. And that's what he did. And that can still be done by people. Oh, I don't want to go out of town. I want to go out of town. You're a Shomer Shabbos Yid. If you go out of town, they gave up much more in the old days for Shomer Shabbos. They were fired every single week. We know 100 years ago, if you don't come on Saturday, don't come on Monday. And they kept, they came on Friday, said goodbye, Charlie, they gave him a paycheck, and I looked for a new job every single Monday. Uh, those, are, those who did that have from children today. Those who didn't do it, you look at the children are Jewish today, 100 years later. And, uh, you have to give up a lot for Shemir Shabbos. So if it means getting a little bit less prestigious residency or moving out of town, I believe it's something which has to be done. And this is oh. not <laughs> can't dispersions on the doctors from 50 years ago. They had no alternative. Uh, now that is a new question, a specialty. I believe if you you have a desire <clears throat> for specialty, that you need that specialty. You have to have specialty, and that specialty has no Shomer Shabbos possibility. Like the doctor to fifty years ago, so you can you're allowed to go into that field, in my opinion. But of course, with all the restrictions that you can possibly have, make sure the machinery, the rabbonah, and try to get out, try to switch, try to this, try to that. 
everything you possibly can. I spoke too much. What are your questions? <laughs> so I, I guess, firstly, Mark and I have to interject downstate in our experiences, at least as good as Harvard. Thank um, you. <laughs> and uh, Rabbi Glott, um, yeah, that, that incredible fellow. He proves it. He proves it, clearly. Um, so I, I guess our next question is, you, you mentioned that if, it, if it's a non shabbos Shabbos accommodating specialty, uh, that you're able to use the precedents of the doctors from 50 years ago. So are, are you saying that Shemir Shabbos, in terms of Shemir Shabbos residency, doesn't need to enter your calculus as to what sort of doctor you want to be? Here's a story. It should enter your calculus, I believe certainly should, not only in terms of what doctor you want to be in your training, but doctor you want to be in your whole life. You know, let's put the halacha aside. Put the halacha aside. I mean, halacha is an isim halacha of the Shabbos. A good Jewish man wants to be a proper husband and a proper father, which requires him to be home on Shabbos. Forget about Issa Malach. Put Issa Malach aside. You want a field where every Shabbos the, the, the father is AWOL. Chas the kids can grow up in a, inappropriately. There's no, no role model. The father can't take his children to shul. He can't, it, it's just not a good idea. Some people are just so driven to be, I don't know, this kind of surgeon or that kind of specialty that they're willing to forego what I call the Shabbos experience long-term, I think it's a mistake. I would discourage them. But you know, people are so set on certain things, you can't talk them out of it. And I'm, I can't just say it's completely prohibited. I say it's ill-advised, ill-advised. But if it's only during the training period, which in some specialties, that's what it is, once you get past the training, then you can make your own hours, open your own office, and you can be home every single Shabbos. That's less onerous, obviously. A person wants to specialize in a field where he knows that during the training, the internship, the residency, you're not going to be able to get a Shomash Hamas position. The Dafka feels he needs that particular specialty. I would not say that he, he's not allowed to do it. I would not say that. I'd say he's allowed to do it. Would it be better if he chose a position where he doesn't have to do any Chilash Hamas ever? Of course it's better. But that's one of the Shikulim, one of the considerations that they bring it to, to bear. Okay, so now to get a little bit more, to go kind of further down the algorithm, so to speak. Um, let's say provide, you know, you're going to an ENT residency or a urology residency, there's no shop, shop, shop is possibility. Um, now you're looking at friendliness, so to speak, or accommodation that they will, they will allow. Um, there are some programs that are big enough and they allow you to trade or they trade, you know, with, you, know you, you may have to pay your co-residents, make sure that you, you know, um, are as convivial as possible. Um, is that preferred uh, versus, you know, your Harvard or your or your Yale? It's not only is it preferred. I think it's it really a must. The same as you must aim for a totally Shoma Shabbos when that's possible, when that's possible. I believe you must attempt to get into what they call a de facto Shoma Shabbos, which theoretically it's not Shoma Shabbos, but in reality, based on those who went through the program before you, they said, I never, went to, I never had to work on Shabbos. I was always able to switch. Or almost never had to work on Shabbos. I was almost, almost always able to switch. That's what you should aim for. And if you give up on Harvard, so you and, give up on Harvard, you live without it. And to follow up on that question, and I know we didn't send it in the notes. Um, okay. Uh, to what point are, are you required to pay for it, so to speak? So in, in uh, the Ramah writes, all you boss is the VAs from Chaymash. Uh, but this is, I know, I know. So the question is, that to what point financially, would you have to try to make accommodations? Look, everyone has their own financial situation. I'm not here to, to, uh, to, to measure your pocketbook. But if it's a matter of paying somebody and staying home for Shabbos, you should do it even if there's no use of malacha. It's time to be home with your family for Shabbos. People go to hotels for Shabbos. Oh, I want to have a good time. What does the course go to a hotel for? Do you know what the course go to a hotel for Shabbos? Anybody know? I think you can easily get a residence for a small fraction of the price is go to a hotel. So stay home from all your hotels and then pay and pay your residents to, to, to go to work for you. All right, fair enough. Um, so I, I, I did, I did ask, so you model this more like remission models this. Do you uh, have any critiques of the way your film is almond models? That, um, is there any preference to? I, I, you know, you said at the beginning there are three models of Schechter, of Shlomo Zahn, of Rameshim. I'm not familiar with the nuances between all three of them. If you, get, if you tip me off, I'll be able to answer your oh, question. So my, my apologies. So Shemiz Alan looked at it in a, in a, in a slightly a unique way. So he, he doesn't frame it in terms of Reish Memchas, in terms of Eva. The, um, what he frames it as instead, he says that provided that you have uh, Jewish patients in that hospital or under your service. 
really your question is, are you allowed to be involved with the pikuach nefesh of a Jew? And he says, you have no obligation to avoid that sort of pikuach nefesh. You may have some responsibility to try to pay off your resident to avoid the pikuach nefesh of an Eni Yehudi, though, of course, you know, when push comes to shove, you would still treat all humans equally. But he says, you have no compunction in order to, 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 to not treat a, a Jew who happens to be in the hospital. Uh, therefore, he, he, you know, he, there's an outcome in there. Um, the, the novelty is he doesn't require you to live close to the hospital. He says that you don't need to try to be close to the hospital when Shabbos hits. Uh, he says, as, you know, the minute you can make kish with your family and the minute Shabbos call comes in, you can take your Uber straight to, straight to the hospital. Because at that point, you don't have any reason to avoid a Pukuk Nav Now, I agree. I agree with Rosh Hashanah's approach. I know Rav Moshe holds not that way. Rav Moshe says you should turn off your machine, turn off everything. Be nothing to do with Yidin Nagoyim. He says you should uh, let someone else do it. I, I know about Rav Moshe's tshuva. So if, if that's the distinction, then I'm on Rav Shlomo Zalman's side, if I may use that expression of that equation. Rav Shlomo Zalman says very clearly, in terms of going back and forth, Shlomo Shemir Shabbos quotes it. That's my, my, my answer to your very first introduction. I'm happy to help those who help people. It's a mitzvah to help those people who are saving lives and be making as much as possible. That's what I believe. Okay, so now, um, all right, all right. So now we have a third consideration. Uh, so not only consider a program that's able to trade, uh, but you're also trying to add in your framework uh, a population that may be more or less Jewish. For example, it might be preferential to be in a hospital in the tri-state area versus a, you know, a very prestigious hospital now in St. Louis, ironically. That is true. That is true. Um, I, I do believe that if you, if you, take, if you implement Rabbi Shlomo Zalman's rule, I do not believe that he requires any particular percentage of Cholim Yisraelim. Even if there's in Holcham B'Bikuach Nevesh there could be a Yisraeli coming in, and that's good enough. Obviously in Israel, it's always good enough. In America, uh, there are different percentages, and I'm fully aware of that. In general, we don't, we, you know, we're not uh, doctrinaire about this, but uh, I know many of my doctor friends who went in Aliyah said, you know, we're helping people. You can't help the whole world. We'd rather spend more of our time helping Achenu B'nai Yisrael. Not that we don't want to help other people, but we allowed to prioritize in life. If you had a brother, wouldn't you want to take care of your own brother? So, you know, we, we believe that uh, everything, every, we, we are called achicha in the Torah many times, any Yisrael called an achicha. So, that's another consideration, I agree. But um, if you had two, two hospitals, one with a high percentage of Achena B'nai Yisrael, we're working on Shabbos. And one where there's a low percentage, but you're not working on Shabbos, I would add for the latter. Okay. For all those personal considerations as well as the technical legal. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, that's very instructive. That's what I think. Uh, it could be many who disagree with me. This could be my opinion. So for a student right now in school debating, I don't know what field I want to go into, they don't really have to preempt what field of medicine um, will will be able to maximize Shabbos. They can really look at it from the point of field of what field of medicine do I feel I belong in and then look at where how I can maximize Shabbos in that way. I mean, they don't have to preemptively pick a specialty that's only a Shomer Shabbos. I believe that is the case. I, I can. I don't want to, to be completely oblivious to it. It's better if a person takes Shabbos into the equation. But, you know, in some equations, there's one factor which is so looms so large that it outweighs the other parts of the equation. Mm -hmm. I have to be X or I have to be Y, whatever it may be. Could be an OBGYN, could be an ENT, could be a nephrologist, could be a surgeon, could be all kinds of, I, this is where my heart is set. Uh, a cardiologist, whatever it is, pulmonologist, I'm just rounding off a bunch of specialties <laughs> that I know about. And, and if this particular specialty, I know I'm gonna have to be, be somewhere on Shabbos, there's no alternative. Whereas if I pursued something else, maybe radiology, dermatology, psychiatry, I don't know, whatever it would be, I have mean, much more chance of, of being able to stay home every single Shabbos. But my heart is not in it. In an expression when it comes to Torah, I think there's something that's true of all professions. You want, you want to be into your, into your chosen profession. You want to feel you have a passion for it. You're good at it. You want to do it. You want to help people. 
So I don't want to discount that completely and make him into a robot. That's only worried about considering Shabbos. Of course you should consider Shabbos. So if it's in your mind, there are two equal choices, and one is more favorable to Shabbos, you should pick the one that's more favorable to Shabbos, clearly. But if there's one thing, you're, in, you're, in, you're, you're always set from your youth to be an ex-doctor, whatever you want to call it. And there is no Shabbos Shabbos internship or residency. I'm not going to try to talk you out of it because you want to be a good doctor and you feel that this is where your talents lie, where your passion lies. And I don't want to say you can't do it. I, would, I wouldn't say that. And, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Now, Yoni? Um, Rabbi, to tweak the out of town Shaila a tiny bit. So, Rabbi said if you have a, a spot in St. Louis that's Shomer Shabbos versus Tri State, which is not Shomer Shabbos, you obviously you have your kids, you have your family. I'm talking about somebody in that situation where they have children and all that. So, let's this say they're fellow, going. This fellow had little children. You know, most people in this stage of life have little children. You know? Right. So, let's say it's not St. Louis. Let's say it's somewhere else where the Jewish community is exceptionally small, exceptionally, exceptionally small. And their children, they may be getting Shabbos with their children, but the rest of the week of their children, the, the schooling and things like that. St. Louis, when this fellow was there, was no great shakes. Got better since then. And therefore, I, I, still, I still think that way. So I guess another way to phrase that question, what about the, in terms of family life, uh, that can take a, a large... No. Yeah, yes, I know it's a sacrifice. Yeah. It's certainly a sacrifice for for an Asia's doctor, for the doctor's wife. She makes many sacrifices. This is certainly one of them. Her whole family is from, is from the New York area, and she slept into St. Louis. She doesn't want to be there. Her husband wants to be there. Can I tell you a secret now? I'm looking at the audience. Looks to be <laughs> looks to be male. I'm not sure that some people are only have a uh, uh, phone on, but you know, in today's world. Sometimes it's the man who goes out of town because his wife is a physician. And Erlem Hafakhani Roa. And I'm not opposed to that either. You know, it's not not uh, traditional role modeling in our community, but you know, <clears throat> the world changes. And if that be the case, and it is the case, I know someone uh, moved to uh, Cleveland, Ohio, because the wife had a nice job in Cleveland, and then the, the husband found something there too, even though he might have otherwise chosen a different town. You know, Cleveland's a very big uh, medical town. And, you know, that's that's what it is. That's what it is. I see someone is telling you about his Sloan Kettering, Shoma Shabbos, interventional. Ooh, he must be very good to get that position. <laughs> um, I think he, he's sharing his contact information. But um, I would like to, um, just, just to take it one step further. So uh, it sounds like you're saying to really that Shabbos really would uh, outweigh the, the difficulties that you may have with uh, your family and, and you're bringing your family out to a uh, you know, more rural area, even in terms of chinach, it's, it sounds like it, that's still worth it for the management of Shabbos. But I think, now it's true, the chinach may not be as great in those towns. You know what? Rabbanim also make sacrifices. Yeah, there are rabbis who are not rabbis in the New York area. They go also to those towns to become rabbis. What about the chinuch of their children? They say, Rabban Kot, the ones who have a brocha, to those who go out to the, out the boondocks, to serve as Rabban and Rabbeim, and they have good children. So I give the same brocha to the doctors. If you have mice and for Shabbos, you'll have good children. So um, just to take that one step further, um, someone asked a really great question. If, let's say, one was accepted to a Shomer Shabbos program, but that program has, um, I guess for lack of a better word, like toxicity. So we, we know that in certain environments, certain residency environments, to be very straightforward, they, they can be really rough for residents, um, uh, rough in every way, um, in terms of time, in terms of just the environment that can be just extremely cruel to, to the residents. It's, it's unfortunate. Um, and so where, where would that factor in, in terms of an accepting and a sh- uh, Shabbos, Shomer Shabbos spot? that may ultimately cause just a lot of distress. Um, there, there are even hospitals that unfortunately have very high suicide rates. Uh, we're talking about extreme stress conditions um, versus somewhere that's just much more conducive for a good life and good mental health. Um, any, 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 any program that triggers suicide should be avoided. So for mental health, we can say possibly depending on, on the, it's obviously a scaled it's value. Not, not a consideration. You shouldn't even consider it. So one can forgo the Shabbos position there. 
Don't do Shabbos, no Shabbos. You can't, you shouldn't consider it. Uh, I did want to take a minute just to, because um, I know I had a misconception about the match. And if we're talking about weighing all the options in terms of accepting a Shabbos position and a non-Shabbos position, I just wanted to take a minute to everyone listening to explain a little bit about the match for just a second. There is really, if we're talking about how you have to weigh your options and maximize uh, Shabbos observance and you want to put all those um, spots on top, I know a lot of people get worried about listing the programs that are more likely to take them that are not Shomer Shabbos and putting it lower on their ranking. And, and they think that may hurt their chances of getting into those spots by ranking the, the Shomer Shabbos spots they may not likely be able to get. And I just want to take a second to explain that with the match, that's not really how that works. And so um, I don't want to get into technical algorithm, but essentially if let's say you put your first five spots and Shomer Shabbos residencies and you are likely not to get them, and your sixth spot is the spot you are likely to get, and it's not Shomer Shabbos, you still did your tachos and you didn't lose out because when the computer um, reaches that sixth spot that you put in, it reads it as if it's your first spot now. So if let's say you're competing now with another candidate who was in, who put that hospital that you're now applying to um, as their second spot, it doesn't matter that you put it at six and they put it at two. When, the, when it goes into the algorithm, it's just going to look at wh who, who the hospital ranked higher. It doesn't care that you listed it as six. And now it reads it as if it's your first choice and that other applicant's first choice. So I just want to tell everyone in the group here, in case this was not something you knew, um, if you do have to maximize your taking your summer Shabbos spots and you want to list them really high, you will not lose out um, by ranking the, those other more um, valid options that you may actually have a chance and you're not losing out by ranking it lower. Right. And just uh, so the dispensation to being allowed to join a non Shabbos accommodating program, uh, in a way, maybe more halachically taxing, uh, because if you're off on Shabbos, it's very easy to keep Shabbos. But to keep Shabbos in an, in a, in an environment that uh, you need to be a, a quasi paisic in your own right. Is there any way for incoming interns to non Shabbos Shabbos programs to prepare themselves with the halachic know how uh, to best navigate Shabbos in the hospital? Well, you know. Loaded question. When, no, it's not loaded at all. Whenever doctors tell me, or medical you know, seniors in Shiva College tell me that, you know, they're graduating and they have time now because they took their MCATs already and there's, there's free time until they enter medical school at the end of the year. What should they learn? I tell them, learn Nechel Shabbos. Take the Shemir Shabbos Nechel and study from cover to cover because that's going to be a main halachic problem area is going to be Shabbos. Of course, there are other problems too, end of life, etc. But the main problem is going to be Shabbos. you got to be adept to know what's a Daraisa, what's a Darabonam, what is Mutu B'Shas you know, It's important to know. Laws of Shinuyim, Amir Lenochri, these are you know, the, all the, especially those chapters about Pikuach Nefesh. If you know the Shemir Shabbos format from the last 10 Prokim of 41 are all about Pikuach Nefesh in one form or another. Some are not so relevant to, to, every, to every Shabbos, but it's, it's a lot of, lot, there's a lot there. There were also some other wonderful spron that came out since the Shemir Shabbos Kulchas. It's the Orchos Shabbos of, is a particularly great series of three svarim, I think volume two or three has a whole big, big chapter. But chol sheyesh bo sakana, chol sheyin bo sakana. These are all important categories to familiarize yourself with and learn the halachas, what to do. Very, very important. All right. So, so far, the rabbis, uh, the rabbis, uh, the book recommendations of Nishmir Shabbos, Kachos Shabbos. And I think for for anyone who's more of a, a lay person like myself, I really enjoyed. Um, uh, the the book that why you put out uh, with Dr. Karp um, the sacred uh, training act the rap, well, yeah that's that's the one I think I wrote, I could be I wrote something about the Maskama maybe could be I don't remember <laughs> he showed it to me in TypeScript and I I, I, could, I wrote a letter I don't, I don't remember. Still remember you did and the letter was the letter was beautiful um, and, and 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 we'll take this all out in post <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Okay, so what's a what's a good way? I, I feel like now um, that, that a double opportunity is first to understand this from a Terry perspective, but also to get some FaceTime with uh, with you. Is there a, is there a way? Are you willing to take more uh, 
medical clients, so to speak. Um, is there a way that people can get in contact with you? With doctors have been calling me for, for you know, <laughs> many, many, many years. Baruch Hashem. I, when they, if they get me, I'm usually pretty accessible. I have a whole slew of doctors in my own tiny little shul. I have a small little shul, but the ratio of doctors to uh, non-doctors is, uh, is pretty high. And you know, we have many specialists, not all. We can use a couple of the most specialists, but uh, we have quite a few physicians. And they asked me, Shilas, and uh, we've been talking about these things for as long as I can remember in the shul with Tokum. I'm in my shul now for, well, it's going to be, believe it or not, 48 years if you in a couple of months. And the next month will not be 48th year since my prabha, which is Parshas Toldos, November of 1973, believe it or not. <laughs> so uh, I've been here for a while. And uh, the number of doctors in the shul is much higher now than it was then. Then there were one, one doctor. One doctor, that's the doctor who was the president of the shul for many years, and he may have been the only MD at the time. Maybe. Now, there's so many of them. Uh, we are beneficiaries of a number of nearby facilities if you want to live. For example, Montefiore is even walking distance from, from, uh, from, from, my, from my community. Uh, now that uh, the Valhalla Center was taken over by Turo, we're getting many more uh, physicians moving in. They want to be close to that facility and maybe the closest, how should we say it, strongly Jewish Torah community to that. So we're getting a bunch of doctors from that group and from Einstein and from Montefiore. So we have quite a few. Some of them, many of them are only transitionary. They move out, they can't afford a house here. That's the reality in Riverdale and many communities like that. But some stay. And uh, we're very blessed with having their, uh, their presence in our community. And we talk about medicine, Shilas, all the time. Um, so that said, do you think that we'd be able to, maybe afterwards we could discuss possibly like... Uh sending your contact information. Maybe you could be just available. We have... Uh... My, I, my, uh, Yoni knows all my numbers. <laughs> They're not secret. Okay. I've, I've no, I've nothing, I don't have an unlisted home numbers or some numbers. I don't have to list it, but he knows it. And I have an email and I have a text and a WhatsApp. And I don't always look at these things. That's the point. I, I'm not tethered. I'm not tethered. You know, not based medicine, yeshiva. We have what we call the chayam, we no penner. To turn off your phone, and I try sometimes to do that. Even if I, I, I turn off the volume, obviously, and I either hear the feel the vibrate, don't feel the vibrate. When I can go eat, leave the space matters, go to eat some lunch. I look at my machine, and I thought, oh, you missed the call two and a half hours ago. All right, so I missed it. If it's an emergency, they're not to get me. You talk to any YU student. Everybody here knows some student in YU. I've never had trouble. I've never had trouble. <laughs> Just get, get it to call me in an emergency. You know, when cell phones, cell phones first came out, I strongly resisted it. I didn't want to have any cell phone. And uh, the shul president said, it was a doctor, Rabbi, we'll, we'll pay for your cell phone. My response then was, I do not want to be on a leash. On a leash. They can tug me. <laughs> Whatever you want. And I refused for, for a long, long time to, to go. I think 20 years, I was not, a, people had cell phones, I did not have one. Didn't have one. It started when one summer in Camp Marasha, the landlines weren't working. They had no alternative to get a cell phone. They had no choice. There was no landlines. So the kid said, oh, Abba has a cell phone. You're going to keep the cell phone. No. Came back in August. I gave it away. I don't want it. The following summer, the same thing happened. And then came the deciding vote. My rabbis told me, at your age and stage in life, I want you to have a cell phone. <laughs> Always do what your wife says. <laughs> the few years I carry around a cell phone, and uh, for better or worse. And then once I had a cell phone, then, you know, I needed ways. I didn't have any ways, so I, had my, I used to call up my kids from the highway I said, ah, but get yourself a smartphone. So when my phone broke, I got a smartphone and they got ways. Then I got I ended up getting WhatsApp. You know, gradually text, but people text me. I don't I don't even see it till the next day. Where were you? Why don't you respond? I said, I don't look. 
So I'm not completely tethered to the to the gizmo, but I carry it in my pocket. When I go to shul, I leave it home. But in yeshiva, it's almost always in my pocket on vibrate. Uh, in my office, I'll put it on on the ring. So in case well, while I'm there, I'll also leave it charging there when I go to say a shear, so you can't get me for the shear. Whatever. Pretty accessible. That's great. Um, I just want to open it up. I don't know if we gave anyone a chance, but if you have any specific questions that we didn't address and you want to either ask them now or you want to submit in the chat, feel free to, we can uh, end off the session with a lot more um, personal questions that people may have. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for joining us and, and answering the... I'm looking at my, at my watch I've been for an hour. I, most sessions don't last more than an hour. I told you only I'm willing to stay longer than an hour. <laughs> so, I deeply appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. And forgive me. I can't. My I can't turn my video on right now. Um, I'm Label Bronson. I'm a student in MSU Michigan. Um, I'm wondering. I mean, it, I I feel like I learned a lot, and I appreciate everything you spoke about from a very halachic perspective. I'm wondering if you have thoughts on 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 more the chinuch from you know, uh, how things are perceived when you have older children and, uh, and how that may or may not play into your decision. And, and more particularly, like um, one thing I worry about, even if things are mutter and there's a hetter that uh, you teach your kids, you talk to them, your whole life is around Yiddishkeit and then they see, you know, their father, um, driving or whatever to work and and yes you can explain but at the end of the day a kid is very black and white so i'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that stud him with that yeah i think that when it's when it's when it, when it doctors children get older they should make even a greater effort to be home on shabbos both for the reason that you just said that kids uh, don't understand how is it possible that uh, the father can pick up and leave in shabbos and in his own car, or even in an Uber. How is it possible? And number two, you want to be home with them to study with them Chumash and Rashi. You know, because once they get a certain age, it's even more important to be to be home. Uh, many of the residents I deal with have smaller children. You know, we'll call them preschool children, not before first grade. Then, that's it's still a consideration, but not as great. Once they hit first grade, it's really, really important for the doctor to be home as much as possible on Shabbos. If he has to go in, he explains to him what you're doing. You're allowed to go in with an Uber, you're allowed to come back with an Uber, uh, because that's, that's a critical part of, uh, of Shabbos for the entire family. I appreciate it. I, don't, I know myself and at least a few others that I, I recognize on the chat are a little later to the party than preschoolers, but thank you. <laughs> Okay, I mean that's a, we, we 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 don't believe in in ageism, you know. Not everybody has to be uh, how should we say it, single focus from the time they turn by mitzvah to become a doctor, and they you know they go straight through the high school and straight through the to the college and straight into medical school and straight into residency by a fairly young age, and even if they're married by then, they the kids are still young, but there are many who choose medicine a little bit later in their in their lives, a few years later, and then that. It could be good to get married early and then get to medical school somewhat later. So by definition, if they're blessed with children right away, they're they're going to be older when when the father isn't going, you know, disappearing on showers. That's true. It's unavoidable. You can't help it. You, if you want to become a doctor at a, at a bit of a later age, it's wonderful. It's a tremendous mitzvah. You have to try to work harder in educating children who are older. Explain to them that what you're doing is a, is a mitzvah. And the rabbis would say it's not just allowed, but it's, it's required, and that uh, Shabbos is very, very critical. Bikuch Nevesh is Docha Shabbos. You can open up a safer if they're old enough. Look on a Mishnah, look on a Gemara, Shulchan Aruch, a Rambam. The Rambam is the best text to use. Perik Beis and Shabbos. Just read those first few Rambams to, to your children. If they're able to get a Rambam with dots, the Kudus, they should be able to read it. And it explains there how critical it is, how important it is to do Michal Shabbos to save a life. And it's cruel otherwise, and people think the Torah is, is not Rachel Darchenom. It's a very powerful Rambam. That's, that should be the primary text to teach the children. Ayesha Kayach. Thank you.
Um, I, I refrain from asking the very detailed questions. I think we would love to have a session um, at another point, maybe um, how to deal with like very specific problems that one may um, you know, have in a hospital, just basic getting around, navigating, um, even just going up and down an elevator. If it's not directly in, in patient care, I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Is that uh, how difficult do, do residents really find it in trying to keep Shabbos? Um, it's you know, not elevators, you know, um, elevators are not a problem only for doctors, they're a problem for everybody. Uh, it depends on what kind of hospital there is. If the hospital has a stairway, you go up the stairs, some have escalators, you go on an escalator. If neither is available, you have to get from one floor to the other. Of course you go on an elevator. Either someone else presses the button for you, or if not, the famous shinui. You go, go like this, your elbow, press the proper floor. That's what is there still done. a shinui in the age of COVID? It's a shinui what? <laughs> is it still uh, it was Derek's high. Is it still a shinui in the age of COVID to use your elbow? Oh, <laughs> I <didn't say> <laughs> you'll have to answer that question. I'm not. I'm not in the hospital. I thought the answer is yes, but maybe I'm wrong. All right, if that's the last. Uh, if that's, that's it, last yeah. Okay. We'd like to really thank the Rob for spending his time with us. Um, we you, really Rob. appreciated it. We should give thanks to Yoni because he's the one who got me into this, and uh, he'll get me out of it too when uh, when when it's necessary. Okay. Thank you very Pleasure much. To you. All the best. Take care. Have thank a good you night. So much. Take care. Bye bye.